Chris Nolan from Sailing Vessel Navigator in the West Indies. So far in this series, we've learned how to measure the angle to the sun and use that angle to determine our latitude at noon. In this episode, we'll refine our knowledge a little bit and learn about the standard sextant corrections that we need to make. Always remember the big picture that celestial navigation is used at sea, away from land. If you strive for an accuracy of about 15 miles, you'll be doing just fine. But to get a little more accurate, we're going to take a look at the three sextant corrections we need to make. The first correction deals with the sextant itself. Even though it's set to zero, sometimes there's a bit of error built into the sextant. So the first thing we need to do is take the sextant out and determine index error. When you look at the horizon with the sextant set to zero degrees, you should see an unbroken line like this. However, it's more common to see a slight break in the horizon. It indicates a little bit of index error. When you bring that horizon back to level and then read the sextant, you can determine your error. If the reading is slightly above zero, in this case 2.0 minutes, you have an index error on the arc and you need to subtract that value from all your measurements. If the reading is below zero, in this case 3.0 minutes, you have an index error that's off the arc and you need to add that value to all your future readings. Either way, you should take horizon measurements before every site to determine your index error. The second sextant correction deals with your height above sea level. All calculations are based on an observer at sea level. And when you're on a boat, you're obviously close to sea level, but there is a distinct difference. Take a look at this side-by-side -side comparison of sunset from, from two cameras at the same GPS position. The camera on the right was filmed about 15 feet above sea level. The camera on the left was filmed about 45 feet above sea level. As you can see, the phenomena are observed to happen at different times and at different angles depending on your observation height. Height of eye corrections are always subtracted from altitude measurements. Luckily, the Nautical Almanac has an easy table for this calculation. It's called DIP and it's located inside the front cover. Simply look up your approximate height of eye and then subtract the appropriate value from your observed altitude. The third and final typical correction to all sextant readings actually encompasses a couple different items. The first is the fact that the atmosphere can actually bend the image of an object in the sky a little bit. The second refers to the thickness of the object we're looking at. Back in lesson one, we learned that we wanted to shoot to the center of the sun, but we couldn't. So we shot to the lower limb of the sun and added a correction. Every time we bring the sun down to the horizon, we use the lower limb and then add a correction. Well, the correction is also located inside the front cover of the nautical almanac, and it's called a main correction. It's under the altitude correction tables. All you have to do is enter the table with your appropriate month and whether you shot the lower or upper limb of the sun and pull out a value. So in summary, correct for the sextant itself with index error, your height of eye with dip, and the object itself with main correction. If you apply these every time, you'll be as accurate as you can be. Let's take a look at an example problem. In this case, we're west of Mexico, approximately 107 degrees in longitude. If we take a measurement at 1150 local time, because of that longitude, it translates into about 1850 GMT. If our sextant measurement is 80 degrees, 35.3, we have to start by making our three sextant corrections. The first is index correction. We measure the horizon and determine that we have a two degree index error. So we subtract it and come up with a new figure. The second correction has to deal with our height of eye. We know that we're about 10 feet above sea level when we make measurements. So we look in the dip table, come up with a correction of negative 3.1. Again, we apply that and come up with a new figure. This figure is called apparent altitude and we use it to enter the apparent altitude tables. We look under our appropriate month and the limb that we shot. We come up with a main correction of plus 15.8 degrees. Once we apply that to the figure, we have our observed altitude. From then on, it's the same procedure we learned last week for calculating latitude at local apparent noon. The first step is to determine our zenith distance. So we take the sextant reading and subtract it from 90 degrees to come up with our zenith distance of 9 degrees, 14.0 minutes. Then we look in our declination table. In this case, we've estimated it. We'll get back to that later. We come up with a declination figure of 8 degrees, 28.7 minutes. Then it's simply a case of drawing our picture and determining that the sun is in the same hemisphere as us, but lower. So therefore, latitude will equal zenith distance plus declination. We do our arithmetic and come up with our latitude. In the example problem we just talked about, we estimated our declination. That's because the nautical almanac only lists whole hourly declinations. 
However, to be more precise, we can interpolate for declination, which simply means to mathematically determine the exact declination for the time we're looking for. In order to determine the exact declination, it's best to think of declination as hours and increments. Previously, we've just looked up the hours. In this case, at 1800 hours, the declination is 8 degrees 28.7. But if you look at the bottom of the column, you come up with a D number. In this case, the D number is 0.9, and it represents the hourly change in declination. So if we want to account for those 50 minutes that are still out there, we use the back of the book, the increments and corrections pages, flip to 50 minutes, and then look under the V or D correction tables for 0.9, and we come up with our corrected figure. In this case, it's 0.8. That 0.8 needs to be applied to the hourly figure to determine the total declination. Since declination is increasing, it's added in this case. So total declination is the hourly declination plus the increment to become your total. The last thing we're going to do this week is introduce a concept we'll need in the future. We've learned before that any celestial body has a geographic position, or a GP. That's the spot on Earth directly beneath the object. If you were standing at that spot and looked directly overhead at your zenith, the object would be shining back at you. As we said before, declination is the latitude of the spot of the geographic position. But on a spinning sphere, longitude is a bit more nebulous to define. Where do you begin? There's no zero point. By convention, due to the politics of the situation, it was decided that Greenwich, England would be the zero point for longitude. Longitude on the Earth is measured westward from Greenwich, 180 degrees, and eastward from Greenwich, 180 degrees. These are our hemispheres, the western and eastern hemisphere. But in celestial navigation, it's a bit different. Longitude is measured continually westward from Greenwich, all the way around the circle, and back to Greenwich again. So longitude needs a different name. It's called Greenwich Hour Angle, and it's the angle between Greenwich and the spot directly beneath the celestial object on the Earth. It's measured always westward from zero all the way to 360 degrees. The concept of geographic position will be critical going forward. So in summary, the latitude of the GP is declination, and the longitude of the GP is Greenwich Hour Angle. Let's take a look at an example problem in which we determine the geographic position of the sun. In this example problem, we're interested in finding the geographic position of the sun at a very specific time. 6 hours, 22 minutes, and 45 seconds. The first thing to do is break up that time into its parts. 6 hours, and then 22 minutes and 45 seconds. When we go into the almanac, we'll be looking up figures based on these two parts. For Greenwich Hour Angle, in the Nautical Almanac, we look down on the date we're interested in for the hourly value at 6 o'clock. We come up with 270 degrees, 34.6. We add that to the first column. We still have to account for the 22 minutes and 45 seconds. So in the increments and corrections pages, we open to 22 minutes, scroll down to the 45 second point, and look at the value next to it, which is the correction for Greenwich Hour Angle for the sun. In this case, it's 5 degrees, 41.3 minutes. Now that we have all the figures, we add them together and come up with a total GHA of 276 degrees and 15.9 minutes. In terms of declination, it's a process we've already learned. Again, we look for the date in question, and we come up with the whole hourly figure of declination. 22 degrees, 02.7 north. As you can see, it would be easy to estimate declination, but we'll do it right by pulling out the D number from the bottom of the nautical almanac. Then we look back into the increments and corrections pages for the time of 22 minutes and we come up with the D correction of 0.1. Adding these two figures together we come up with a total declination of 22 degrees 02.8 minutes north. Now we've determined the exact position of the sun at the time in question. The GHA of the sun is equivalent to its longitude, and the declination of the sun is equivalent to its latitude. In this fairly heavy episode, we've refined our accuracy by learning about the three main sextant corrections, index error, height of eye, and main correction. Additionally, we've refined our accuracy on declination and learned about Greenwich Hour. Practice what you've learned, refer to the notes below, and when you're ready, we'll move on.